Hello and welcome, Sparkshort fans, to today's story. A short tale of something that lurks in the dark. So, if you're ready, pull up a chair, relax, and prepare yourself. Yet just before that, if you like what you hear, please consider subscribing to the channel and leaving a like. It's a small thing to ask, but it really helps the channel to grow. And know that you'd like to hear more. And with that, let's begin. It had been an almost typical September day in the lazy suburb of Lawrence, Indiana. The townsfolk busied and bustled, going about their everyday lives. Mothers and fathers took their children to and from schools, and all the while, it slept. No one knew of the danger they were truly in, for if they had, the town would have been deserted long ago. They say stories are built on legends. Over the years, they become embellished and enriched, with the original tale becoming lost through over-distortion. But what about those that are never told? Stories so dark and horrific, they are best left forgotten and never to be disturbed, for the want of safety and out of shame. Long before Lawrence was constructed, the original indigenous tribes that wandered the lands spoke of a beast so deadly, so carnal in nature, that it transcended anything that had come before. For centuries, the tribes would come to Lawrence, sending their best hunters and warriors to try and slay the creature that lived deep in the earth, as it had long before man had walked the planet, or so it was believed. Yet as the warriors and hunters failed, the creature would stir, and before too long these tribes would be attacked and disappear with no trace left behind except for their screams in the dead of night, with only the woodland critters to hear their calls for salvation. Over time, the tribes would stop sending warriors and hunters and begin offering up tributes for sacrifice as to stave off any assaults, though soon even those would stop, and the creature in the dark faded back into the murky depths from whence it had first been disturbed, thereby allowing once more for it to slumber until another unfortunate victim waded upon it. And so, as evening fell upon the town, the citizens turned in to watch the evening's television, playing their games, reading books, or spend their time however they so chose to. This fateful September night, however, the power grid failed throughout the suburb, casting it back into an airy darkness, like one which had not been seen since decades earlier. The power grid company quickly traced the outage to an underground fault line, which had gone down, disrupting the whole grid. Bob McKinley and Frank Tullyman had been dispatched to investigate and repair the issue, hoping that it would be resolved quickly 
and without too much aggravation, calls to the general populace. Frank Tullyman, a long-standing company man, having given twenty years to the job, exited the van first. The only illumination came from his high visibility jacket he wore, which reflected in the headlights of the van. Due to the power failure, having taken even the glow of the street lights from them. Frank was quickly joined by Bob McKinley. He too was an experienced company man, having dedicated so far ten years to the job. He handed Frank a hard hat as they prepared to descend into the bowels of the world to fix a rather nasty problem. As both men lifted the manhole cover, the darkness that loomed back up at them seemed more unnerving than any before. Whether it was the total blackout or deep sinking pit in the stomach that seemed to grow with each passing moment, neither could be sure. Bob took two flashlights out of the van, handing one to Frank, while he set about turning his on. He watched as Frank descended deep into the earth, watching his flashlight grow dimmer and dimmer, until it was only more than a pinprick of light, carrying as much illumination as a star at night. Once Frank had reached the bottom, he hollered back up to Bob that it was all good for him to come on down. The further Bob got, the more he could hear the turning stream of sewage water, and the stench grew ever greater, like that of rotting corpses. As he reached the bottom, his feet squelched against the damp brickwork. The flashlight gave them a grim view of never-ending darkness. Both men knew the direction they had to head, yet with every step their fear grew, and they would almost as one feel as though they were neither the only ones down here, and that something was watching them. Even being experienced in this line of work, it wasn't settling, to say the least. Not wanting to linger a moment longer than was needed, they both doubled their walking pace locating the junction box towards the end of a long passageway. As Frank cast his flashlight over the circuit box, it looked as though it was covered in a thick algae-like substance, rather than dirt and grime. Bob brushed his right hand across the algae, coating his gloved hand in what now appeared more like a viscous slime than simple mould and mildew. It was as Bob opened up the circuit breaker, noticing that it looked like the cables had not only been slashed, but the slime seemed like it was corroding the inner workings. The darkened sewer tunnel was beginning to play tricks on Frank as he continued to watch out for his partner Bob. Every droplet of water carried an echo. The churning water bubbled and gurgled, sending a myriad of noise up and down the winding and twisting wet, damp tunnels. It was as Frank listened to the noise, trying to drown out certain sounds, that he heard something behind them, 
like something displacing water, or that of squelching liquid like, like footfall, moving towards them. He turned his flashlight back down the passageway, hoping to see if he could find the source of the noise, but he couldn't. It was in that moment he then heard the sound of something slashing out, like someone had used a wet whip to corral something behind him. He turned back round, seeing the horrific sight of a slender, long, wet, viscous tongue with protruding needle-like spikes coiled and wrapped around Bob's neck. As he watched, he could see hot steam like that of melting flesh bubble and boil around the area of the coiled tongue on the neck. He couldn't hear any sound from Bob. Either this thing had either immobilized him, paralyzed, or even worse, already killed him before he could even utter a word. With fear gripping him fully and tightly now, he followed the spiked appendage upwards, and there, Clinging from the ceiling was a huge, translucent, horrific amoeba-like creature that began pulling Bob off the floor and in one quick whip-like motion devoured him, its slimy-like body wrapping and filling around him with a grisly sight of Frank watching Bob's body dissolve into fluid for this thing. Frank had no idea why this thing hadn't yet attacked him, and he had no intentions to find out. His only thoughts now were to get out of here, find his family, and get the hell out of town quickly. As he began backtracking slowly from the corridor, not taking his eyes or flashlight off the creature. His foot passed over a puddled section. His heart suddenly jumped to his mouth as the amoeba-like creature turned with almost feline instinct, locking its gaze on him. By now, there was nothing left of Bob. He was completely gone, bones and all, every sinew and fibre melted away. Frank wasted no more time. He turned and ran back the way they had came, hoping to get out before it could catch him. Once he saw the ladders, he knew he was almost home. Quickly he climbed, his upper torso ascending back out of the ground for a brief moment. He stopped, thanking his lucky stars. In that moment, he felt a slimy wet rope wrap around his midsection, followed by the painful sensation of thorns or needles embedding into his body. He looked back seeing a pair of eyes looking back at him from the darkness before he was pulled back down into the earth.